That's better. That thing drives me crazy. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, you'll have a good time. I'd like a lot of people to do this, uh, people who are entertainers. I'm available to you all the time. I'm around somewhere, usually in a bar, but I'm around. <laughs> you see me come talk to me. Uh, don't hesitate. You want a picture with me? Fine, we'll get one. Whatever it is you require. Uh, I would not be standing here, it would not be for you. Fans drive this, not me. Okay? All of you drive this to the popularity it has achieved. Which is absolutely remarkable to me that it's done that. <clears throat> I told my wife when this started, I said I was going to watch this crap. It's just murder. Because <laughs> to me, it's just murder. I did it for a living. And she said, oh, you're wrong here. You're wrong here. But even she has been surprised. Uh, I think Discovery is surprised at how successful they do it. They're kind of shaking their heads about this. It's in that. Uh, Currently plays in 178 countries and 50 languages. That's all it's uh, all over the world. And, uh, it's interesting, you may not know this, I never knew this, I never knew any of this until I got in this bracket, but uh, the world doesn't make television, they buy it from American networks and the BBC. They have no actors, they have no cameras, they have nothing. They buy American and British programming, they put their language to it, either by voiceover or subtitle. And that's how they entertain their audiences. So every year, they have the Golden Globe Awards in Cannes, France. That's for movies, where the Foreign Press Association shows up and then all the movie stars go and so on. The week before that, they have something called MIP, M-I-P. And it's French, and I used to know the words, but everybody calls it MIP, as are the initials, M-I-P. And at M-I-P, the U.S. networks and the BBC show up with their wares, all their programming, and the world's buyers come and say, what do you got for me? The number one popular show worldwide for the past 10 years is American Reality Crime. <laughs> I have to have one of those. And as a result, they buy it like there's no tomorrow. So my producer sent me a photograph. He was in France at the event, and he's standing at the Discovery booth, and he stood in this picture for a relation to socks. He looks like a little tiny guy. And there is this gigantic picture of me over the Discovery booth. <laughs> and I said, you think that's big enough? He said, it's 30 feet high. <laughs> I said, that's probably big enough. He said, it ought to be. It costs $10,000. <laughs> and it, it's like a magnet for the buyers to come and buy this program. And uh, my daughter, it's a GS4 team called the Strike Command at Barstow Air Force Base in Louisiana. She and her husband both. They're responsible for security nuclear weapons in the United States. She's a retired Air Force major. And they don't have cable TV. They work like dogs. They don't want to She knows that dad has some show. He was dead on the bars. You know, he's got a show, you know. It's on TV. And that's all kind of she knows. Well, she's married, so nobody connects her to me. Because her last name is her husband's name, right? So they don't know. So last summer, I called her. I said, is your passport current? Well, you know, your husband? Oh, yeah. Let's go to Ireland for two weeks. She said, I can't afford it two weeks. I'm not asking you to afford it. I'm asking you to come. I want to go? Yeah, I'll take care of it. Let's go. So we did. We went for two weeks to Ireland. We didn't draw a sober breath all the time over there. It was great. <laughs> and it was my daughter's exposure to my notoriety. So we're at the Dublin airport for like 10 minutes. The Sky Network broadcasts in Europe, Africa, Middle East, everywhere. And they have a network called CI, which is their version of ID Crime and Investigations on Sky Network. I'm the number one show on Sky Network, number one show in England, the UK. Okay? So everybody watches it. So we're in this airport, and this Irishman comes up, and he says, Mr. Kennedy, I have your autograph, sir. I said, of course. So I signed, you know, I gave it to him, and I said, thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. I said, you're welcome. My daughter's jaws in her chest. You know? she looks at me, she says, Dad, what? That man called you by name. I said, Yeah, he did. Well, how does he know your name? I said, You might be surprised, but I'm pretty well known. So the next place we go is to Blarney Castle. 
Because they want to kiss the Barney sign, everybody has to kiss the Barney sign. But you do upside down from 110 feet off the ground, by the way. It's a little bit of a dangerous thing to do. But anyway, we've already done that. So uh, kids want to go. Oh, we want to go. All right, fine. In front of the Barney Woolen, or Barney Castle, was Barney Woolen Mills, oh, yeah. which in the 19th century was a woolen mill. Now it's an Irish target. You know, it's this giant store that sells everything Irish. You can buy kids, infants, boys, girls, men, women, whatever. My wife and daughter, boom, through the front door. We're going to go see what's in here. I'm doing what husbands do. I'm leaning on a shelf, <laughs> waiting for the women to go through and pick through all the items they have to see. And there's a manager, a guy, who's walking around. The place is packed. There's a million tourists in there. They have a register every 10 feet in the store. And uh, this manager's walking around checking to make sure everybody's working and uh, everything's happening. He comes by me and he stops and he turns and he says, you're Joe Kenda. I said, I am. He says, what the hell are you doing in here? I said, well, everybody has to be somewhere. <laughs> so when my wife comes back, I've, I've got surrounded by cashiers and they were all taking pictures and everything. She just starts shaking me like uh, Sorry. Um, uh, I get recognized in France. I've been recognized every place I go because it, it's everywhere. Uh, in France, they played in, in two languages, French and English, and French too. So it's very bizarre. Uh, Kathy and I still marvel at all of this. It's like, what? what? Yeah. They want to talk to me. We were in Paris, and around the Champs Elysees, we're walking down a, a sidewalk. We sit down in the sidewalk cafe. And the waiter comes over immediately. The service in France is excellent. And all men, no women, men waiters. Boom, here he comes. He stops 10 feet short of the table. Monsieur, he says. You know, I go, oh, God, a minute. So where am I? Is there a sign that says, don't sit here a minute? That's, that's what I think he's doing. You are Joe Kenda. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My wife's like, I can't take you anyplace. So she <laughs> when this first started years ago, they send limousines, so I go to the airport. So, uh, and if Kathy, and I have her in my contract, she travels at her discretion, at their expense, limousines, first class here, or class to hotels. Whenever I go anywhere, she goes with me. The sad commentary about that is that, I'm, according to Discovery, I'm the only entertainer that has his wife in their contract. Ooh. The rest of them, they don't want her around, or they don't want to chase girls, or whatever. <laughs> so when Mrs. Kenda shows up at these events, she is an anomaly. They all look at her like, oh, yes, well then, you're uh, Mrs. Kenda. <laughs> what the hell are we going to do with her? I don't know. Has anyone ever experienced that? You know, so it's, and, and she gets a big kick out of that. They're all like very awkward. You know, like, oh, well, maybe you can see if you're, yeah, okay, fine, I'll do it. Yeah. Anyway, when we first started, she, uh, nor I, had ever ridden in a limousine, ever, you know. And we're, they're going to take us to the airport season one episode, you know, we're going we're to begin this process. So the limousine comes out of driveway in Colorado. And uh, the guy builds out the business suit up to the left of the door and says, Madam. And Kathy just stood there and I said, Kathy, she said, what? I said, you're Madam. <laughs> <laughs> She knows she's mad with now, but she didn't know that at the time. I thought that was pretty fun. So we moved to Virginia because of my son. Uh, he oh, was a commander in the Navy at the time. He just retired September 1 after 26 years in the Navy. Wow. He was a defense contractor for Booz Allen Hamilton. And he does secret stuff. And he told me what he does, he doesn't tell me. So I, I don't know what he does. But he, he does it pretty well, apparently. They pay him well, so he's very happy. And we decided, I decided, you know, women outlive men. They do. Our daughter's in Louisiana. Who, she's trying to go to D.C. because they're not real happy in Louisiana. Uh, so they're going to go to D.C. Hopefully, if they can get that done. So we'll all be within 200 miles of each other if we are all in Virginia. So I looked at my wife and I said, how many people do we know here that are either not dead or haven't already moved to Arizona? <laughs> so, well, not too many, and what the hell are we doing here? We're shoveling snow. Yeah, so we moved to Virginia. So we buy this place out in the woods. I'm not a big fan of humans, as you can understand. So I have 22 acres of trees. You can't see my house from the road. You can't see the road from my house. 
And no one had lived there for a couple of years, and I'm surrounded by a Georgia Pacific tree farm, 4,000 acres. So I don't have any neighbors. But there's a farmer that, he's from North Carolina, and he leases ground, and he works his fields around my property. And he sees us there, and he kind of looks at us, and I see him on a tractor. Well, here comes a limousine, right? Down this country road, my camera <laughs> escalated, and pulls in. Now I'm like driving, he's like, watch as he walks I go there, he sees it two or three times. My wife and I are in it, we wave at him. And he just, he stares at him. So one day I'm at the mailbox, and he pulls up in a power store diesel pickup, and he bails out, and he says, I'm Ricky Morgan. Well, who's Ricky Morgan? I'm the farmer. I'm, I'm over here. I said, oh, I'm sitting on your tractor. And he immediately said, what do you do? What do you do? Looking at me, I said, well, Ricky, I'm a drug dealer. <laughs> and the color drains out of his face. And I said, that woman is with me? She's my bodyguard. <laughs> she carries two nickel-plated 45s in her waistband. And I said, you talk to her, be careful what you say to her, because, you know, she's usually been drinking. <laughs> and he, about, he, he now has an attack with cerebral palsy. She gets back in his truck and he drives up. I don't see him for six months. I see him again and he says, you son of a... I said, Ricky, you were just too easy. I was like, hey, you can't go to the radio, but I had to do it. <laughs> he, he and I are friends now and he lies for me. You know. that, you talking about that, that, that movie guy, that, that television guy? He don't live around here. Who told you that? Yeah. So, he's on my side. But anyway, I thought it was pretty funny. He was not amused for six months. But, oh, you got to keep people on their toes, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and you never see me smile on a show because murder's a serious business. And if it was your loved one, you would want to see me smile. But it's an opportunity for you to meet the real me, not the TV me. Okay. And the TV means the professional thing. The show itself is, uh, has 285 people, if you count everybody, that's involved in making it. It's complicated. It takes us from February to November to do 20 episodes. I've completed my part of it, and uh, Brian Davis is in here someplace from Knoxville PD. He, uh, I think the, uh, the, the final uh, Ending of the filming of the reenactments is November the 12th, I think, when they actually finish the reenactments. So it's a 10 months to make these. Uh, we work hard at it. The result is, I think, rather good. Everybody else seems to think so. Too. so uh, the rule was when it started, when it started, I told Discovery, I said, don't you ever, ever Hollywood this. And if you do, I'm gone. I will walk in the middle of a contract and you can sue me if you like, because I don't have anything anyway. So go ahead. <laughs> but we're not gonna do this car chase, gunfire, girls in skimpy outfits deal. We're not doing that. Criminal investigation is one foot in front of the other. It's grunt work. Get from A to B to C until you hopefully get to Z. It's not the glamour, it's not, it's 24 hours a day, you're starving to death, you can't stand up, you're so tired. That's the reality. And they said, okay, I said, we're gonna present these reports the way they happen. We're gonna change a few names. The only names we change <clears throat> is if we call somebody a name or we say they're kind of a bad guy and we don't arrest them for something, we have to change their name or we've committed libel because we've said they're bad guys and we didn't prove it, all right? so. We change the names of some of those people. But the defendant is always the defendant, you know, because he's convicted of the crime. We show his picture at the end of the program, the actual dude with the numbers under his face, you know. And so it's as real as it gets. It's case report from page one to last. And what I do do, because the show is 43 minutes and 50 seconds long, in the United States, 43.50, the rest is commercials. In Europe, they don't have as many commercials. It's 52 minutes and 10 seconds long. So they see nine more minutes of show that you never get to see. And that's most of the okay? uh, So I have to reduce a murder to a tellable story that I can tell in 43 minutes and 50 seconds. 
If I were to tell you about a murder case the way it actually happened, the show would last for 16 weeks and nobody would watch it. <laughs> it would make you crazy, as murder makes you crazy, okay? Uh, you go down this rabbit warren, it's the wrong one. The next rabbit warren knows nobody in here of interest either. Then you do all the prime suspect. Oh, man, I like this guy. And he's in jail the night the killing happened. <laughs> Start over. That's the way it really is. Okay? So I select the highlights of the case and I present to you uh, a discovery of human remains and to a courtroom and how we got there in 43 minutes and 50 seconds. And I'm a storyteller. That's all I am. In addition to being a detective, I'm a storyteller. And for thousands of years, people have gathered around the fire and said, tell me a story. If you tell it well, we'll ask you to tell another. And that's all I am. I did this for a living because it was a passion for me. I was on a mission. I would have done it for free. This is kind of a not have concurred with this. <laughs> I would have. I would have. When I recruited people for homicide, you had to get past me. So if you want to apply to be in homicide, you're a policeman. You think that's what you want to do. That's great. Come on down. We need to help. The first step in that interview process, which I would control, is I'm going to give you three pages of a murder report. In that three pages is enough information to write a search warrant for that address. I want you to write an affidavit for a search warrant. How are we going to establish probable cause to believe evidence can be found at this location? You have one hour. You can do it in Korean. I don't care how you do it, as long as I can read it. And if they pass that thing, then we can move on to a few other steps. But the final thing I say to them is, <clears throat> here's what you need to understand. You're going to join a very small club that chases the true bad people. As a result, you are speaking to the most unforgiving guy you've ever met in your life. I have no sympathy. I left it in my other pants. <laughs> don't ever tell me that you're tired. Don't ever tell me you're hungry. Don't ever tell me you have to go home and see your wife. If I, if I thought you needed a wife, I would issue you one. <laughs> we are here to do this. You want to do this with me? I will be right with you. I'll be kicking the door and going through the skylight with you. But it's us versus them. Now, if you don't want to do that, well, shake hands. You can go ride a motorcycle, go be a narcotics detective, whatever you want to do. No hard feelings. And a lot of time, but I don't think I can do that. Okay, great. Thanks for telling me now. Um, see ya. Enjoy your career. But other guys, no, I want to do that. Great. Come on down. You go from being an old guy, or a new guy, to an old guy in about 15 minutes and all of a sudden, there's no rookie status. Go to work. Let's go to work. I recruited a kid. His name is Derek Grant. He's still a homicide detective in the spring. Great guy. I recruited him because he was smart. He had good street smarts. I just liked him. You know, he was he was a thinker. He didn't jump ahead at something. And so I, I convinced him to apply. So he applies. I took him, of course, immediately. And he comes to work his first day. He looks like a banker. You know, he's in a hard shaft and he marks. And I said, boy, you look terrific, Derek. No, thank you. <laughs> so we're he's here for about an hour. And because I'm the boss, I have a window. All right. I call him and say, hey, come here. Yes, yes sir. You see that? Rising smoke on the horizon down there? Yes, sir. I said, that's a house fire. Is it? I said, well, not really. Derek, it's a concealment fire. The fire department has found a woman in that place, shot twice in the face with a 45 automatic. Somebody burned this house to cover the murder. And it's your case. And he looked at me and he said, sir, I've only been here for about an hour. I said, I know that, Derek. <laughs> But I, uh, I'm going to throw you in the deep end of the pool, and I'm going to see if you can swim. I think you can. But let's find out. I said, I'm going to go with you. I'm coming with you. And I won't say a word unless you do something hopelessly illegal. I'm just going to be with you. Let's go. So we walk outside. He's so upset, he can't put the key in the door lock. His hand is shaking. <laughs> Two days later, he arrested the guy that did that, and he did a fine job. And I said, so, Derek, what have you learned? He said, that was the best experience of my life. Baptism by fire. There you go. And he's a good kid. 
And that's all it takes. You only need two things to be a great detective. You need a knowledge of the law. You need to know what you can do. And more importantly, you need to know what you may not do. And the only other thing you require is an undying sense of curiosity. Somebody made this happen. Who is that? You want to go from a shadow in the night to a first, middle, and last name at a date of birth. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is euphoric when you reach that stage. It is. And it's even better when it takes a long time sometimes. I had a, uh, a case where two sons, 19 and 21, are in the drug business. They're selling crack cocaine. They live with their parents. Their parents know they're selling crack cocaine. And they participate in the profits, mom and dad. So they are doing this out of their house, the family home. And this kid comes over, their supplier, and they get in a dispute and they murder him in the basement of the home. The parents are in bed when this occurs, but they wake up and they hear the commotion. And they decide they're going to conceal the death, they're going to remove the body, and they're going to act as if nothing happened. So they take the body out of the house, they dump it in the mountains, we, didn't, we don't find it for five days. And they bleach the basement and they do a lot of work. They remove all of this level. When we find the kid, we do our thing, we come back to that house. <clears throat> the dad is an absolute jerk, okay? Absolute. You don't have the right to be in my house, get out of my house, you on and on and on, and screaming at us. We can't prove anything. And I told him as I was leaving, the last time he threw me out of his house, I said, you know what? Someday, my boy, your knee's going to touch the ground. And when you look up, you're going to see me standing there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Yeah. Five years go by. His brother-in-law is a convict who gets out of prison and moves in with the rest of these bandits into this house. They get in a dispute, and their brother-in-law stabs the shit out of this guy and almost kills him, all right? But he's in intensive care of Memorial Hospital, and he's going to survive. He's a multiple stab ones of the chest. So I got the brother-in-law by the throat, and I said, you know, the problem here, Eddie, <clears throat> is you have two prior convictions for a felony. You know what that means? When I can convict you on this, it's a virtual criminal, and you're going away forever. Life in the slammer. You like that? You like eating those bologna sandwiches? Because you're going to be doing a lot of it. <laughs> And he's looking at the table. I said, unless, of course, there's something you know that I'd like to know. And he thinks about that for a few minutes. And there is no loyalty in the bad guy world. None whatsoever, not even with blood. They rule over on their own mother because of their advantage. Okay? I helped them take the body out of the house. I, all right. So I go arrest the two sons. Arrest one first. He rolls over, confesses to the crime. The rest of the second kid, he rolls over as well, confesses to his involvement in that. I go to the hospital. Here's dear old dad, right? Tubes everywhere, and he's in intensive care. I say, hey, remember I told you five years ago your knee touched the ground, you look up and see me? Well, today's the day. And I hang up and he's and the nurse says, you can't do that. I said, I can do anything I want. He's a prisoner. You know? And this officer will be standing here the entire for the rest of the time. He's some officer will be standing here 24 hours a day until he gets up. Then he's not a slammer. You know? And everybody says, he starts to cry. I said, oh, you're not going to cry. Oh, I hate it when they cry. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a great thing to experience that and to be able to say to yourself, we did the right thing. We did the right thing. It never mattered to me what kind of victim you were, if you were wealthy and from a white middle class family, whatever, or you were a drug dealer. Nobody gets to play God. You don't get to do that. You don't get to decide who lives and who dies. And so everybody suffers the same penalty. And everybody suffers the same effort. You're my victim. You're my victim that you are a despicable human being that everybody hated with good reason, 
It is not my problem. The problem is you've been violently killed by someone. And that's not permitted. You can't do that. So we're going to find who did this to you and are going to bury him under a jail for the rest of his day. And that's why you said do it. And you pay a price for that. You the nightmares and the PTSD and all that. But uh, that's the, what you pay. It's, I'll pay it. It's all right. As I put a lot of people in a cage, I need to be in one, and they're never getting out. They're not going to hurt anybody else. They're just in jail. What happens in prison a lot of the times is that uh, people get tired of prison in a few months. They don't like it there. <laughs> so they send me a letter. And they know they know the game because they're criminals. They say, I know about a murder. They <laughs> say think that, that or this is their big advantage. You know, that they're gonna have information that's gonna get them out of custody, get them a break, do something. And I'd show up at the prison, I went there all the time. But phoning up a reason to be to take the guy to the population, he's gotta go to the warden's office for a medical exam, whatever, so that nobody knows what he's doing. And he's in there talking to me. So you walk in, they're always arrogant. You know, uh, all right, yeah, right. so you have, a, I assume you have a list of demands. Yes. Okay, well, let, let me have those because before we begin, I want to write them down so that I, I don't forget anything. You know, so. And you see the look in his face like, oh, maybe this is going to work, you know. <laughs> so I said, oh, I can help you probably with your list. You want out of jail, right? Well, yeah. Do you, do you like to be out today? Well, yes. Okay, well, out of jail today. I'd write that down. He's like, yeah, that all right. Better than I thought, right? And of course, you're going to need money. I mean, you can't just get out of jail. I'm like, how about 100 grand? That'd be all right. 100,000 dollars? Yeah. Needs 100,000 dollars. I just keep writing all these ridiculous things. And then he's like, well, now he's really hurt. You know what I said? And so when I, when I offer these demands, that you're going to tell me what you know. Yeah. So I looked at him, I said, is it my turn now? Do I get to talk? Well, oh, yeah, okay. I tear the piece of paper off the pad, I tear it up and throw it in the trash. <laughs> Let me tell you something, convict. Let me explain how this is gonna work. You have 60 seconds to tell me something I don't know. And if you can't tell me something I don't know in the next 60 seconds, I'm gonna walk to that microphone, I'm gonna tell the yard that you're in here talking to me. They'll kill me. Exactly. And you're down to 45 seconds. You still have a list of demands, you piece of shit. You know, you want to tell me what you know. So, what they know is something they overheard in the dining hall, a guy who said a guy. You know, it's all useless. It's all hearsay information. And you throw the guy out, and that's the end of it. But every once in a while, you get somebody that's a participant in the murder. In a, in a peripheral kind of way. And I had that guy do that one time. I did, went through the same routine. I said, so what do you know? And he just looked at me and said, I drove the car. Oh, my. That was interesting. <laughs> oh, no, and wound up, we, we took care of that guy. Because he, you know, he testified against everybody, everybody went to do. It was a stick-up crew that were, they killed somebody. And he was the driver. And he knew everybody's name and what they did, and it all worked. So it does, it was worth it to go, but 99% of the time it was not useful. So I've rambled on for 45 minutes or so, or 30 minutes. We're going to take a little break for about 15, come back for Q&A. And at that time, you can ask me any question you like about any subject. You may not like the answer, but it will be the truth. <laughs> so I'm going to give it back to James, and I'll see you in a couple of minutes. OK, here we go. Place that up, say so your first name and where you're from. There are some more episodes like that. In fact, we had one last week involving a, two idiot kids with a 22 <laughs> rifle, and you know, they're, they're blasting away at a streetlight, never killing anybody. Yeah, but yeah, there are those coming up as well, that, where no one died. You know, uh, they should have or they could have, but they didn't. You know, so uh, yes, that's, there are more of those. Yeah. And also, we're starting filming season nine in February. So. <laughs> So here we go again. Uh, my name is
name is Kathy, and I'm from Long Island, New York. And um, the, it, I know the Springs is near several military bases. And we saw in a few episodes that there was, you know, some interaction between you and uh, the military there. It, was that, what percentage would you say? I mean, we only see a fraction of what actually went on during your career, but what interaction with the military, was that a lot? Well, it was in some cases and none in others. There, there is a military industrial complex in Colorado Springs. The generals liked it there, so there's a lot of things happening there. And there's NORAD, North American Air Defense Command, there's Schriever Air Force Base, there is Peterson Air Force Base, there's Fort Carson, Colorado, and there's the United States Air Force Academy. So.